I am Bernhard Güller. I am principal guest conductor of the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra and music director laureate of Symphony Nova Scotia in Halifax in Canada. As you can see, due to the crazy corona times we are living in, I speak to you from our home. I have known Peter Martens since a bit more than 20 years now. And in the last five, six years, our collaboration intensified, also because he rejoined the orchestra here as a principal cellist. And so we played quite a number of concertos, he as the soloist, like Dvořák, Cessance, concerto by Viotin, Friedrich Gulda. Last year we re uh, released a CD together with the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra with the Concerti by Viotin and Cessance and shorter pieces by Cessance and Fauré. The collaboration was absolutely wonderful. Peter is a fantastic cellist and a great artist. If you would make a worldwide survey with the question, who is your favorite composer? You most probably would get lots and lots and lots of names. Of course. If you would ask in the same survey, who do you think is the greatest composer of all times? I am absolutely convinced that 98 plus percent of all the music lovers, professionals, amateurs, orchestra musicians, conductors, composers, young, old, men, women, would say without any hesitation, Johann Sebastian Bach. It is like kind of a law of nature. Bach is an absolute phenomenon on many levels. There is, for example, the factor time. Where did this man find the time to write all this music which we have today from him? In his time in Leipzig, in the Thomaskirche, for many years, he had to write a cantata for each Sunday. We have more than 200 cantatas by him, which we know. We also know that he wrote many, many, many more. Over 100 cantatas are lost. So one has to know, a cantata is a piece for soli, choir and orchestra, about 20 minutes long. So you have to invent this thing. You have to write a score. You have to write the music. There maybe he had some help. And then you have to, I don't know whether there was really time to rehearse, but at least one time they had to play this thing before the performance in the church service on Sunday, and then Monday he started the next one. It is incomprehensible, actually. He also had to play the organ for the church service, for funerals. He had to conduct the church choir, the children choir, and at certain times he had to teach Latin and religion. And he wrote the St. St. Matthew's Passion and the St. John's Passion and the B minor Mass and the Christmas Oratorio. In the time before he came to Leipzig, he was working in Köthen, in the court of Prince Leopold from Anhalt, Köthen. In that time he wrote many, many secular music pieces, like the harpsichord concerti, the violin concerti, the flute concerti, Brandenburg concerti, 
the orchestra suites. What is also absolutely remarkable is that all the pieces I mentioned now are all on the highest artistic level. And when you talk about the high and high artistic level, you actually think that the creator of these pieces has to have a place where he can be on his own and concentrate and, 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 and. Bach had 20 children. That means that at least for 25, 26 years, there was constant baby, toddler and children noise. Not exactly the ideal place you would imagine a composer needs for creating this unbelievable music. In Curtin, he also wrote lots of chamber music. He wrote, for example, the first part of the well-tempered clavier. He wrote flute sonatas, trio sonatas. He wrote solo violin pieces, partitas and sonatas, and the suites for violoncello solo. Without any hesitation, one can call these pieces the greatest music ever written for this instrument. I am or was a cellist myself, long, long time ago. I started when I was about nine years old. And all the string players, and especially their families, know how painfully long it takes until you can create a straight tone on a string instrument. And then you play open strings, and then scales, and then simple etudes, and then more complex etudes. However, it's never really satisfying music. When I was 11 years old, I, my parents bought the music for the six cello suites. And I was technically just able to try to play the first movement of the first suite, which is not very difficult, or maybe at least parts of this movement. I don't know, uh, remember anymore exactly. But what I remember exactly, it was one of the two or three most important, magical, breathtaking moments of my musical life. It was a revelation. It was the most defining and determining moment of my whole musical future. That from then on, it was clear what I will do. It was like entering a fantastically illuminated room. It was a complete new world. And I will never forget this moment until my last day. Thanks to Bach. And therefore I'm so pleased and honored that I was asked to be a small part of this project. My love affair with the Bach cello suite started when I was a very young boy. My father is also a cellist and I used to hear him practicing these in the evening when I went to bed. Uh, so in my second year of learning the cello, I asked my teacher if I could learn the prelude to the first suite. I wasn't really good enough to play it at that stage, but um, he said yes and uh, well, there hasn't really been a day since then and that was exactly 40 years ago.
that I haven't been involved with the Bach cello suites. Between 1717 and 1723, Bach wrote the violin partitas and the cello suites. The cello suites probably around 1720. At that time, he was Kapellmeister in Köthen in East Germany. When things he wrote the suites for two excellent cellists in the orchestra, the Hofkapelle, Christian Ferdinand Abel and Christian Bernhard Lienicke. The cello suites conform to the traditional Baroque dance suite style in that they all have an Almat, Kurat, Sarabat and Cheek. Bach, however, begins his suites with a prelude and between the Sarabant and the cheek, he adds a set of gallantries. In the first and second suite, he adds a pair of menuets. In the third and fourth, a pair of bourrées. And in the fifth and sixth, a pair of gavots. The suites were first published in 1824 in Paris and little is known about any public performances. Then Pablo Casals comes onto the scene. The fantastic Spanish cellist came across the sheet music in a second-hand music store in Barcelona in 1890 and embarked on a lifelong love affair with these suites. In the 1930s, he made the first ever recording of them. Each suite has its own distinctive character and as Casal so eloquently explains, this is clearly encapsulated by each prelude. He characterized them as first suite, optimism, second suite, tragic, third, heroic, fourth, playing the pedals of a great organ, fifth, dark, dramatic, threatening, the sixth, a hunting scene. As with well-tempered clavier as with the violin partitas and his many works for organ, each Bach prelude has a majestic, radiant and glorious expression. I remember when I was a cellist in the Radio Symphony Orchestra in Stuttgart in Germany, we were performing the Szymanowski Violin Concerto, a late romantic complex work with a huge orchestra and many colorful effects. After the huge applause subsided, the series played an encore. The prelude of the E major violin partita. And immediately there was an overwhelming cathedral of music surrounding us all in the concert hall. This cathedral was created by a small instrument, the violin, playing only one line. Only in Bach can you find this phenomenon. It is the same impression I get in the prelude of the sixth cello suite. The first suite, G is the key Bach chose for this first suite. The suite begins with an arpeggiated chord progression, not unlike that of the first prelude of the well-tempered clavier. After an unexpected fermata about halfway through, it meanders through several keys until one can't help but sense the now distant key of G, again at which point the music bursts forth into a rising crescendo, ending in this majestic expression, which I mentioned before. The other movements are relatively short, the menuet being the only dance actually still danced in Bach's time. The suite ends with a kind of unsophisticated cheek 
that presents images of a peasant's dance. And now Peter is ready to perform the suite number one in G major. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Almat. The Almat is a 16th century German dance, as the name indicates. It is still used today with imported elements, many influences coming from Italy, France, and England. Bach's Almat combines the French and Italian style and creates the absolute high point of this dance form. The 18th century composer, writer, musicologist Johann Matheson had this to say about the dance. Quote, the Almat is an arpeggiated, serious and well worked out harmony which represents the notion of a contented or pleasant disposition that delights in good order and tranquility. Courant. 
The Courant is a fast dance and also, of course, from France during the 16th century. Bach again combines French and Italian uh, elements and creates these masterpieces. Another quotation from Johann Matheson, quote, The passion or emotion that should be expressed in a courant is that of sweet hope, for there is something courageous, something longing, and also something that gladdens the soul in this melody. Of all the pieces that together make up hope, the courant has no restrictions, rather it seeks to completely justify its own name through constant running. Peter's interpretation confirms this description. His fast courant tempi underscore this description very impressively. A musical work. What is a musical work? A musical work is not the sheet music. It's not the dots on the page. They don't say anything. That's just a set of instructions for a performer, for an artist. Uh, but the work itself is the sounds that we hear. And the work is not just a single performance, but it's a whole series of performances. So when a composer writes a musical work, he basically gives birth to the work. And then it's up to us as performers to see that work through its life by engaging with it and performing. So it could be a performance by a, fa a famous cellist in a concert hall, a famous concert hall somewhere, or it could be a student just practicing in the practice room. But the point is that the performer and the composer, once the work has been composed, have equal status. And it is the performer's duty to work alongside the composer, as it were, with the material that has been given him by the composer, to be a creator, not just an interpreter, but a creator. And every musical performance is a creation. And so I feel that when I play the suites by Johann Sebastian Bach, that I have an enormous responsibility. I have to sit next to Johann Sebastian Bach with the information that he has given me, and I have to co-create every single time I give a performance. And that's why no two performances are ever the same. And that's why nothing will ever take the place of live performance, because it isn't simply an interpretation of something that has already been done before. It's a special new creation every time. The second suite is deeply moving, but in an introverted sort of way. The first two notes, open D and A strings, set the tone for the entire suite, which, because of its apparent outward stillness, leaves the listener feeling somewhat empty or with plenty of room for their innermost emotions. Even the second minuet in the major key is said and also the concluding cheek is something of a celebration. The absence of real optimism is evident throughout.
Sarabant has a mysterious, even bizarre, history. One doesn't know exactly where it comes from. Perhaps it was an Andalusian fertility dance, or as American musicologist Mark Devoto discovered that the traditional song text for the Sarabant is identical to the Tseyel, a very early Arabian refrain, form which appeared in Spain in the Middle Ages. Or perhaps another theory is true, the Sarabant came from Mexico to Spain. Yet others think it may have originated in Panama. The first mention of a Sarabant was in the files of the Spanish Inquisition in 1569. By 1583, staging a Saramat for, was forbidden. Why? No idea. At that time, the Saramat was a fast dance, 
By 1650 it had slowed down, but the tempo was still not quite clear. Vivaldi wrote different sarabands in different tempi. Some were marked Aleco, some Andante, or Largo. Corelli marked some of his the sarabands Vivace, Aleco, or Adagio, or Largo. Since the end of the 17th century, the tempo were mainly slow, as all those of Bach. The Cheek is a 17th century Irish dance based in an Irish song, a song still used today. Of all the dances in the suite, this is the most dancing one. It found its way through Sammartini into the early classical period, and Haydn developed it into scherzos and prestos in his last symphonic movements. Before we hear the fourth suite, we still talk about the gallantries, the minuets, bourrées, and gabots. Third suite. A majestic prelude opens the third suite. The undulating waves of optimism reach stormy proportions in the middle of this prelude. The great Baltic cellist David Geringas in the many concerts we played together, used this stormy part right up to the end as a cadenza in the first movement of the C major cello concerto by Haydn. A wonderful idea. Even the quiet sarabande exudes contemplative positivity. This suite ends with the fastest and most boisterous cheek of all. Thank you. 
Thank you.